Ruth is here. I know she should have it. I got signed out too. <laughs> hey, everybody. Welcome to the uh, Chaos OSPO Metrics uh, Working Group meeting. Um, we do abide by the Chaos Code of Conduct. The meeting is being recorded and will be published later for people who haven't seen it. You're welcome to keep your cameras on or off, whatever your preference is. We're not super picky. Um, and if you don't mind, if you want to put your name down on the attendees, along with the last book that you read, that would be great. Um, so we have we have a few things on the agenda today. This is looking like a pretty good agenda. So, so Gary, I did put the project viability assessment on the very first part of the agenda oh. because we keep saying we're going to do it and then we don't get to it. So we're going to do it first just to make sure. Um, so I don't know, Gary, I think this came up um, in a discussion that you were having with somebody. Uh, do you want to set the stage for this? Do you yeah, want I'd love to. Thank yeah, you. please. Um, I also appreciate that bringing it up one time and not making it onto the agenda counts as I keep bringing it up. I um, I appreciate <laughs> it being first, though. I, uh, I um, At Verizon, we care a lot. Or let me start with, I started this job at Verizon. This is my fourth week. And I'm tasked with like project viability. How does that work? And it's kind of a very big concept. And this is a group that cares a lot about having functional metrics, whether that be something we're gathering in surveys, something we're gathering about the health of projects we maintain, or in this scope, I care about projects that you are considering adopting into your projects as an organization. Um, how do you gauge whether or not that project is going to be viable? How do you say this is going to be viable, but you know, for a couple of years or 10 years or five years, or this is something that we should instead use vendor software for? Like, what are some things that we think about uh, to make that uh, determination? I'm in the process of working through the very large backlog of metrics that Chaos has to say, these are things that we can uh, automatically gauge. These are things that require physical like or physical like effort from some uh, employee or some person. And then these are strong, weak or moderate like fits. And so in, in this conversation, I'd love to because it's so many people and because there's such a diverse opinion, I would love to hear how everyone thinks about viability. Um, what they think are very important metrics and what they think are maybe not important metrics to gauge whether or not you would adopt a project or how you would gauge if that project's going to stay viable in the future. Yeah, I've, I've actually done a few of these assessments recently um, within VMware for um, things that basically open source projects that people were considering making kind of a key element of one of our products. So um, super important to, you know, to look at, at some of those. And some of the assessments were like, yeah, that seems great. And uh, one of them was like, oh no, please, please don't. Um, so so it's, it's, kind of, it's kind of across the board. And I'll be honest, like when it comes to these types of assessments, it's actually, and I'm, and I'm a data person, but it's, it's actually less about the metrics um, in a lot of cases than looking at, at some of the other things oh. that I think are, are I important. Thought, I, I'm seeing my head. Yeah. Oh, Alyssa, I think can you mute? Like, there's somebody else talking that's coming up on your mic. Thanks. Um, so one of the things I look at is adoption. Like, are other people actually using this thing? Um, and this is especially true if it's owned by like like a company or it, you know a competitor. Even like, are they the only ones right. using it, or are there are there a bunch of people using it? Because the more people are using it, the the better off you'll be over the over the long term I look at I look at governance so if it's you know if it's owned by a little tiny startup for example that that's probably kind of a high risk um if it's owned by you know maybe a company that I trust more around open source maybe that's sort of medium risk if it's um owned by a foundation that's probably low risk lower risk anyways from a governance perspective um I look at whether or not they're keeping up with pull requests or issues. So this one is more of a more of a metric, but are they do they have a gigantic backlog of issues and pull requests that they're not closing in a timely manner? Um, is something I look at. I look at a whole bunch of like project policies. So is it under an OSI license? Is do they have a code of conduct? Do they have a security policy? Um, do they have contributing documentation? Can I find information about their governance? Um, is another thing that I look at. 
And then, and then I look at security. So I run the OSSF scorecard and I look in particular, I look at, so I look at the overall score and then I, I dig down into it. But in particular, I look at open vulnerabilities and um, whether they have some of them, you know, a big pile of like critical yeah. vulnerabilities that are open. And that, that for me is a gigantic red flag along with some of the other stuff in the um, OSSF report. So that's, that's kind of how I do like a, so these are like quick assessments. So this is gut, gut check. Does this seem like something that might be okay? Or does this seem like a gigantic red flag and let's run away from it. Um, but I'd be curious to see what other people, what other people do. I mean, we, we, we would certainly do more of an assessment if we started using it, but, but that's kind of my, my quick one. Yeah, that's super helpful. And I never thought about it as like different degrees of how you might be evaluating a project, right? Of it takes less effort if somebody wants to investigate or do a proof of concept or something that maybe doesn't need the same level of scrutiny that, oh, this is going to go on, you know, a very important piece of hardware that gets shipped all around the country. Like that's something that needs to be a lot more secure. It's something that needs to stay um like we don't have to patch it all the time because it's not an easy thing to patch. Things like that matter too. Yeah, exactly. Uh, uh, yeah, I think I think it's really important to think about how you're how you're using it when it comes to how you assess it. I put a couple examples in the tab of um, things that projects within Chaos and the Linux Foundation have asked for over the years. Um, and what one big open source company is using for this kind of evaluation, which is of course a subset of the metrics and metrics models um, that we've we've generated. Um, and both these projects are in beta right now, but they're interconnected. So you can create a login, you can actually add any repos you want and then see them when you're logged in. Amazing. Yeah, that's awesome. So, what is the like, um, no, that's more of like a technical question. I was going to ask about like how you control access to that, if that's something that you have to think about. We don't. <laughs> okay. I, 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 I have enough uh, credits and funding to keep it going for a while. There's cheap servers in Germany if you're looking for. Good tip. Right. <laughs> yeah, Hetzner. Okay. Unbelievably cheap bare metal. But then you have to play with bare metal. Yeah. But yeah yes. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, one of my talents is I, I'm a semi competent sysadmin. So yeah, it makes that easier. Depths.dev is a good call out. Yeah. 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 I was wondering if, if, I know that depths.dev is relatively new. Is that right? Yeah, the public release of the source code is new. So is that, am I remembering that right, Sophia? They just released an API so you can actually oh, just that's what I meant. query yeah. and implement, pull in the data directly. So you used so you to have, have to aggregate yourself. Yeah, you used to have to go to the site for each project, but now you can use the API to pull data in. Um, right. We do, we run OSS open SSF scorecard against repos um, in Augur, but we don't have a public facing version of that data yet. I work at so, university with um, where I'm the only human computer interaction scholar, so we don't have classes about that. <laughs> <laughs> so, Don, I was wondering if you look at things like dependencies of the projects. That you do. actually that's that's kind of under adopters i just added that as a note to the to the notes but i i do i look at the github um insights tab and the dependence under the dependency graph yeah. um which sadly is is not actually available in the in the api um is it criticality the score i'm sorry is it the down dependence is that downstream stuff i think um, you're looking at the eyes on the project yeah, it's what relies on that project. Yeah, as opposed to the dependencies, which are the the things that that project relies on. So the okay. upstream stuff. Yeah, I think I think that kind of like for the dependencies and how reliable those are in the CVEs that are under them, they normally get flagged all the way up um, the chain. So if you have a dependency okay. two or three down, it will normally make its way back. Okay. 
Yeah, and I do also usually run um, criticality score, uh, which is another um, uh, OSSF project, uh, mainly because it gives you a quick look at the number of dependents and you don't have to click through all the things on the, the GitHub page. So I'm curious here. what some of the other big companies do. Like I, I'm curious, I don't know, Sophia, Emma. Yeah, I have a couple of thoughts. It's mostly that it's it's really different by use case. And say so the considerations for using something internally versus using something in a product have different considerations. Like say, how easy is it to become a contributor to the project and work on the project? Say you might want to have more investment in the community if you're trying to also create a product around it and so understanding right. how welcoming that community is to new contributors and new companies participating in it could be a factor in whether or not you choose to incorporate it into your tool um on the usage side i would say documentation and just kind of quality of documentation um is also i mean that's sort of factored into some of these other broader metrics but it's kind of a way to assess how good their housekeeping is as a community right. um, and whether or not it's usable without having to track people down for questions. One of the things that Dwayne O'Brien uh, did when he was OSPO director at Indeed that I, I thought was that I'd never heard of anyone else doing is he looked at all of the projects he depended on up and down the dependency chain. And he then identified which projects across his portfolio he was most dependent on. So that he had several thousand projects that were directly his responsibility, but over 11,000 projects that he was dependent on to one degree or another. And so he used dependency analysis to identify projects they depended on that they should invest something in. And I, right. I, think, I think that's one way to think about, you know, as, an, as a company who leverages open source, how do you decide which projects that you wanna help make more viable um, with limited resources, obviously. Uh, and I think looking across all of the things you use for most commonly incorporated dependencies is, I thought it was a really great strategy that Dwayne employed. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'm, I think making that pitch uh, in the current economic climate is one thing. <laughs> yeah, uh, you, can't, you can't pitch any new projects or money requests yeah. in the current climate, yeah. Ah, uh, Kevin made a note um, and a, a very in-depth study that he did on this topic and listed his seven high-level considerations. I mean, there's, you know, there's also classically things like activity level. <laughs> you know, if you look at a project and it right. hasn't had a commit in three months, that's a, that's a, that's a sign. Yeah, last updated 2021 is, right. okay. Any other thoughts no. on this? I would, I, everything everyone has said, I, I don't have a lot to add there. At Microsoft, we have, a lot of automation around things like uh, com li license compliance and security. Um, I, I would just say that at scale, one of the things that is a challenge is like within each organization, we ask um, like a business reviewer to be accountable for kind of the final sign off for these types of things. And, and there's, you know, how do you pass on this type of wisdom and tools to those folks? Some of them don't, we would do this intuitively, right? They would look for a, a lot of these things intuitively. We, we can provide some guidance, but um, there's definitely uh, like some, we'll find some that will go quite in depth to things like, you know, there's no activity here. I'm um, gonna make calls on like, you know, we're not gonna use that, but there's no activity, but there actually are plenty of packages, for example, that, you know, don't have activity, but are not necessarily a risk. So. Um, I guess it's just more, I guess, I guess what I'm trying to, to say is like passing along that wisdom, like this group is, you know, has that, is interested in that, but how do we help organizations that aren't traditionally, you know, familiar with open source and how all these things work, 
gain that knowledge as well. So um, I'll just say that that's what I'm thinking about right now. Yeah, that's a really good point, Emma, on, on activity. We actually, we just had a conversation around this in the um, CNCF uh, Technical Oversight Committee because um, we, were, we were looking at inactive projects and what do we do with those? Do we archive them? How do we determine what kind of criteria do we use? And one of the things we were looking at was, was activity. But one of the things that's had the kind of least amount of activity, but it's an open source specification, right? So they finished the specification and it's probably okay that they're not, uh, updating the specification every, you know, every day. So in that super case, unhelpful. lack of activity was <laughs> probably good. Um, and so Emma, you know, I think, I think what you said about like, you know, looking at it in context of kind of how you're using it, I think is really important. Yep. Okay. Cool. I think I think we'll go ahead and move on to the the next agenda item. But this was, uh, was a really interesting conversation. So so thanks everybody, and thanks Gary for bringing it up that one time, and then me continuing to talk about it. <laughs> Thank thanks for putting it first. Everybody had their coffee, and now they've spent their energy on this. Happy. Can, to I, can I make one comment, Gary? If you're if you do move forward with this, love to hear how this goes at Verizon. Like this is there was a pretty long list here. Of things and i'd be curious like where you start if you know and i don't know just how that goes yeah absolutely i mean i i plan on giving specifically the the chaos versions of like these metrics i think are strong indicators for us as an end user as a consumer of a lot of open source mm -hmm. uh and then like Obviously, I won't be sharing everything that we look at for every product and every product line that we do, but definitely want to contribute back to the discussion of what we think is necessary for viability. Yeah, yeah if nothing else, it'd be interesting to have a conversation about the the approach that you end up taking um, at the end, whether, you know, obviously certain details you won't be able to share, but it'll be interesting to hear about how you approach it. Definitely. Thanks. Cool. Okay, next up, um, I thought maybe we'd just spend at least a few minutes on, on ChaosCon and the Open Source Summit in, in Vancouver and maybe talk about some, some key takeaways, what we learned, other thoughts. I think Matt and Sophia, I saw you talking in one of the channels about putting together some some notes. Do you wanna do you wanna start with do you wanna start with that? Not to put you on the spot. It was me asking Sophia. <laughs> Sophia had put together notes. And then I was like, oh, great. You can talk about those notes <laughs> at the next meeting. So <laughs> that's what you oh. get for sharing your notes. <laughs> I can, but the others here were participating too. So feel free to chime in. Um, I think uh, for those that know the schedule, we kind of split it between talk and discussion uh, and try to balance the time between both. And most people I talked to really liked that format. They, they liked being able to meet people and have sort of facilitated reasons to talk to each other. Um, and then so I think in general, I think that was really positive feedback for us as a, a community running event. So I, I thought that was fun. Um, we had updates from Augur and Gormora Labs and our topics were around sustainability in open source and reporting metrics and getting metrics hooks. I feel like that hook word, Emma, stuck with me. <laughs> how do you hook your stakeholders with metrics and really understanding how to apply to that in practice um, and then ending with that software update. So um, I think I, I stuck notes in the chaos committee Slack, but I, I think if, if everyone's okay with them, I'm, I'm fine to share that with the broader community. Uh, I don't know if there are any issues around that. I tried to um, obfuscate any um, personal names, <laughs> but that way folks can add in their own observations as well. Um, I think what really stuck to me in all the conversations um, was I think it was you, Don, and I have to apologize. I think this happened during Chaos Con, but it could have also happened in any of the other talks or discussions we had <laughs> over the course of Open Source Summit, but I think it came from you. Um, but just like kind of talking about how, if you're thinking about the long-term sustainability of open source, we see a lot of programs that are helping to encourage newcomers to open source. And we see a lot of very experienced people that are maintainers and that initiate a lot of these projects, but there's kind of a, a gap in the middle um, and sort of trying to recognize how do we recruit more experienced developers to fill the gap in open source. Even if they're new to open source, they can still bring their experience to it. 
um, and then potentially kind of fill the gap between those that are brand new and learning things and those that are highly experienced but might want to step away um, if we're thinking about the longer term sustainability of, of the open source ecosystem. Do you remember if you said that during ChaosCon or is that actually in your talk on contributor strategy? Because it might- I don't remember. I remember having this discussion, which is, which is good. <laughs> <laughs> but no, it's something we talk about a lot with, for CNCF projects in particular, because a lot of them are very complex code bases, right? And so, so it's great to have like brand new people coming in through mentorship programs. Um, but yeah, I do, I do feel like there's, there's a gap where we need, you know, we, we need to replace maintainers and we're not going to replace them right now with new people who are coming in, um, you know, new to open source, new to development, new to a project. We need people with like, in particular, I, I think I used the example of etcd, right? It's a key value store. It's essentially a database. We need experienced people who know how to build databases to uh, contribute to projects like that and eventually become maintainers because it's not it's not an easy project to contribute to. And so, yeah, I think there's a gap. Is it about somebody external potentially to the project or is it somebody internal or need both? It's about Who both. It's about this maintainer pipeline. So, so the idea is that, you know, you, Maintainers aren't going to maintain a piece of software forever, and so you need you need this pipeline of people who are eventually going to replace these maintainers, um, and you need people with a variety of of skill sets and experience to do that. Because you know when you replace a maintainer, they're going to have to be relatively experienced. So maybe they started in a mentorship program and were brand new, but it's going to take them you know probably three, four, or five years if it's a complex project to become a maintainer. Whereas if you can find somebody to become a contributor, a new contributor who has deep experience in whatever it is that you're building, you might be able to make them a maintainer in six to 12 months, as opposed to several years. I think aligning um, like professional de development opportunities with um, open source engagement, like is a way to get like more experienced uh, uh, contributors. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And I'd, I'd like to see more more companies, um, yeah. you know, they have employees contributing to a lot exactly. of these projects. I would like to well, see some of those to... experienced contributors mentoring other employees with experience into some of these projects, I think would be would be great. Yeah, to that point, I was kind of wondering what responsibility this is to the community and what responsibility it is to the company. Or the companies that are part of that community as well. And I know that it all kind of collapses on itself sometimes, but um, just, I don't know what the answer would be. Yeah. Would you think? And it's, I, I think it's, I think it's both. I mean, in some of these situations in particular with some of the CNCF projects, um, mm -hmm. part of the reason we're having a shortage of maintainers is that some of these companies have laid a bunch of people off and those people aren't necessarily working on those open source projects anymore. So yeah. we're losing some maintainers um, because their employers are, are laying people off or because their employers are deprioritizing things. So I had one case where I was talking to somebody and he used to be a maintainer for a certain project and the company he works for was like, no, we, we're not going to pay you to do that anymore. We want you to work on this other open source project and contribute to it instead. No, yeah. I mean, one, you know, I agree with that. I think the more corporate engagement from corporate developers in a project, the better off a project is. Um, from a student perspective, um, I've seen Chaos Africa and, and Chaos here. Um, the students who've worked on our software, they don't start at regular entry level jobs. They're way beyond that. They, they get really good jobs. My, my students get really good jobs when they graduate. Um, so it may be a selling point for you know, incorporating some of this work into computer science education. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would love to see more open source work in, in computer science programs. That would be fab. Um, oh, sorry, we talked about that topic kind of a lot. Were there other other takeaways from, from ChaosCon or just like the Open Source Summit in general? Were there any talks that you went to that you thought were particularly, um, I don't know, well, interesting or applicable to OSPOs? I'll get some of my feedback. I really like the format of ChaosCon. It was my first ChaosCon, and I really liked the the breakouts, especially you know, 
asking to talk to people that you didn't necessarily know um, and, and collaborate. So that I um, I appreciate that. I think the setup from both Sophia and Emma were really great. Um, and I really liked the questions, Sophia, that like you, the themes that you asked us to start with and then um, the, the sets of questions to, to move the conversation. That was really helpful. Um, I'm still really impressed with the group that we had around uh, this five love languages of OSPO. Um, so uh, probably we'll continue to talk about that in my free time um, was one of the takeaways. Um, and uh, so I really, and I think Chaos Con as like a full day conversation was really, was really helpful. Do you know, like it was uh, as opposed to the other days where you had to like jump in and out of like talks or events, it was really good to like kind of be there um, with everybody for like a complete conversation. Um, and, um, and a really good like setup for the rest, I think of the conference for me. Um, like and I, yeah. Well, I'd say for, a, for something like this talks and small group things to work well, you need an excellent facilitator and Sophia, mm -hmm. Sophia did it like, and Sophia and I think Don Georg. and Georg, I mean, together, just a really a group of people whose personalities are well suited to coordinating people without ordering them around. Yeah. <laughs> it wasn't yeah. me. I think Emma was the one that was Emma, helping. Emma, crazy. okay. Yeah. It definitely I, wasn't me. I was I was a sheep being herded, not a shepherd. So I, I, I wasn't even aware of who my shepherds were all the time. So thanks to Emma too. Yeah, I, I thought it was great. Um for the rest of the conference, you know, I I feel like one of the themes that I was, I found, I don't know, it's like, I almost feel like it's sometimes like about like learning a new word and then seeing it everywhere, you know? So I feel like something that I, I saw as a recurring theme in the conference for the ones, the events that I attended were like a, a conversation around like best practices and standards. Um, and I don't know if that's like a reflection of like Linux Foundation priorities or like where I am in my own like, you know, path and journey or what I'm paying attention to at the moment, but like, you know, um, standards, I've never been like excited about standards, create the, 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 the journey, the process of standards yeah. creation seems like pretty boring when it comes to like open source community work. But um, I I think that there's was a lot of like interesting and exciting like conversations that I seem to have like fallen into about like how do you create kind of best practices, agreement standards, not in a kind of you know mandate sort of way, but rather from a much more collective and, and dynamic conversation. And so I thought that was one of like the most meaningful takeaways for me. Um, as well as just continuing conversation around, you know, how do you quantify and qualify value when it comes to open source and the work that we do is like in the OSPO space. So, but that one has been like a recurring theme, I feel like in a lot of the open source conversations that we take part in, the standards one was like um, a, a, something that I was not expecting to see at the summit. So those were some of my takeaways. Also, Vancouver is like so beautiful. Um, I want to go back like for open infra summit, I think is like next week or something. So, yeah. So, uh, any reason to get back to Vancouver in the spring, um, is, 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 is welcome. Yeah. And that, that venue, like you walk through the solution showcase and you just see like the whole, the whole wall of glass, you can see the yeah. whole burn the mountains and everything. It's fantastic. Yeah. yeah. Um, Christine, you've had your hand up patiently for quite a while. Why don't you go next? Oh, it seems as as uh, Alyssa was talking, she was basically covering all my <laughs> points. But I did I did love the format. I love the fact that uh, George went and bought a bunch of food for us, so it made everything. <laughs> it just made everything feel very casual and like a like you were entering a family. So that was a nice touch, and I I, I did really like uh, I did really like the curiosity hooks. Uh, that I get, that kept me thinking for the rest of the conference. And the fact that this was on uh, Chaos Con was on day one really helped because I felt like the rest of the conference was a blur. I, did, I didn't really experience the rest of the conference, but I was there for Chaos Con and I have all my notes for Chaos Con and not for anything else. So, uh, so, so that was good. So I, I really did enjoy the conference. Thanks, uh, Emma. Yeah, I mean, plus one and a lot of things people 
have said. Um, I, I like, I appreciate the, the, some of the discussion coming out of the curiosity hooks. I have some notes that, about fear hooks. And so in, thinking of like, instead of using carrot and stick, like maybe there's different kind of hooks. I love the, the creativity that um, the Chaos Con brought out through those discussions afterwards. I, I really think it's just a dynamite format for a conference anyways, because everyone's sitting there having some sort of inspiration. Um, and the fact that you can connect with someone in that moment and kind of share that, I think that's really powerful and and, and kind of mul force multiplier of creativity. So good good job, everyone who came up with all of that. It was a pleasure to be with everyone. Like, I was just so happy to be at a conference and see everyone. Uh, you know, I just, um, and what a great group of people. I think maybe there's a story someday. I don't know, Elizabeth, if you started telling that, like, how is the chaos con metrics? Like, how do we place them against our community and like just maybe there's some examples that that we could be showing or case studies about how the chaos community you know is welcoming and you know all these things that we talk about because I think that there's a lot of things that are happening that are really good and could be showcasing anyway um I have drank the kool-aid apparently over here <laughs> um I was really struck uh, oh, oh I'm also very excited about auger and I you know there is that prompt to, you know, not to build things and, you know, how much work has gone into that. I would, I'm really excited to try and see what's, play with that new technology and bring um, Microsoft into that however I can. I, there is definitely this, like, let, we have the data, let's just build the square yourself kind of mentality sometimes. Um, and so, but still we're going and looking at chaos queries. And so I'd love to figure out how to bridge that and, and just stay in touch with the chaos, uh, with the auger work there. Cause that looks really, well, really great. Um, yeah, Matt. <clears throat> sorry, go ahead, Sean. Uh, yeah, I, I, I think uh, chaos would certainly like to work closely with your OSPO. I mean, GitHub is most of the data, so you do have it. Um, I, I think what we've done with both auger and Grimoire Lab is uh, some pretty good data engineering to organize the data in a way that OSPOs and others want to look at it. And that's not the way it naturally occurs on the GitHub platform. You know, we, yeah. we, we pull from literally hundreds of different APIs in order to assemble the data in a structured format to provide chaos metrics. And um, I think, I think there's, there's things we can learn from each other, but the big, perhaps the biggest benefit given that you actually have user interface developers um, and data scientists is just some of the data engineering work that we've done i think could help platforms a lot and help the community a lot and i so i'll just throw that out there yeah. i know yeah, i've I, said that i, I said that before <laughs> i know I, I mean i wish i had more influence um on github i mean we, um, I know his handle, but I'm forgetting his name, Apoch, who was part of, it was a hubber that was at KSCon. He works on dashboards at GitHub and is probably a good person to continue to champion that. Um, Eric yeah, Sorensen, is that the person? Yeah, yeah, that's right, sorry. Don put it in chat, that's on me. That, it's not like it came to me. <laughs> yeah, but I know they're interested in that and I, you know, yeah, so. And then just generally the, the conference, <laughs> I can kind of, I took really good notes also, Christine, for ChaosCon, and then I, my other notes weren't as great. But um, I felt like there's, like, the whole conference, including some, to some extent ChaosCon, I felt like we're, there's two worlds. There's kind of this, like, all the things that are immediately in front of us. That some of the things we've been working on and caring about for a long time, like Cory Doctorow talking about Facebook is, like, an example on the open web. Like, we're still, you know, that's still a problem we haven't solved. And then the a you know AI people you know talking about copilot LLMs like there's that fear of the future like it feels like this impending shadow is coming and most of those conversations for me happen in like hallways or smaller talks or uh, they weren't really on the stage but I felt like they're e like there's sort of an equal amount of focus on the present but fear of the future um, so that was just kind of a meta a meta observation uh, I think. I think um, especially around like communities and AI or LLMs, like maybe there's something to learn there. So that's something actually I'm going to try and understand. Like what do people mean by open, uh, not open AI, <laughs> but like open source AI when they're talking about like that sort of stuff happening. I think maybe there's some measurements that need to be built 
pretty soon around like communities around that kind of technology. So uh, I'm gonna be learning there. Um, I think most other things were covered. Someone gave me um, a good idea based on our, our um, calculation to show the impact of external contributions on internal projects where I've proposed that we try and figure out some sort of formula <laughs> that gives us a monetary value for what those mean. I don't know how far we'll get, but I'll definitely report back on that. So that was another outcome of chaos comment. Like, that's a great idea. I forget who gave me that idea, but thank you. I'll see, I'll, I'll share whatever comes up with this group. That's all I can think of. Thanks, Emma. Jan, you've got your hand up. Yeah, no, I, I agree with a lot of what Emma said. Um, and in thinking through a lot of what everyone has kind of said in this meeting at ChaosCon and at the OSS Summit conference, um, I started to think through like what I really wish I had for my OSPO was a playbook. And I don't know if Matt, you might be able to answer this, if that is going to be part of the to-do group's book in helping to steer some of some ospos into a, a playbook like um product or, or whatever comes out of that book but in terms of metrics um it i would have i would, would really like to see like okay your ospo is here um these are all the different metrics that you could potentially be using for these different topics um, cause, cause I think what I was feeling like I was like trying to gather all of the good pieces that everyone was trying to say and write them down and make it into like my strategy and my, um, what, what we're doing in our OSPO, but I was like, oh, it'd be nice if like, we just kind of had that too. So, uh, just an idea. So I don't want to give that. more work to the group, but it was just, it, it's kind of nice to, um, if it, it would be nice to have something like that. So is it, Chan, is it about like where an OSPO is kind of in their journey and what they should be looking at at those different stages? So like early OSPO, you know, like a early starting OSPO and maybe here are the things that you should think about yeah. versus OSPO later in the journey, you know, like that? I think so, yeah. Okay, um, so I guess I have two comments. One, I, I think I need a little bit more clarity still from Anna on the book chapter. We had talked about this last time, so it's not. I don't think it's real clear if the book chapter, if the book itself, is going to be like an anthology, where each each chapter is kind of different from every other. You know, like each person just kind of writes the chapter and it gets assembled as a book. You've seen these, right? Versus a book that like we all talk together as we write it, like where every chapter kind of builds on the other. So I'm not quite sure what that relationship is yet. And we had talked about this last time because like we didn't want to duplicate what somebody might say in a prior chapter. We don't want to like contradict what somebody might say in a prior chapter. Um, and if we could, you know, use what somebody says as well, that might enable us to take our chapter a little bit further. And so I, I think we, I still need to sort this out with respect to the book chapter that was on the agenda today. So to that question, Chan, I don't really have a great answer, at least not at the moment. Yeah, and I think that's okay. It was just something I was thinking of, even as like Gary was starting to, um, you know, pull all the knowledge from Dawn. I was like, ooh, that's like, those are things I wish I could have jumped to a page and saw all of that too. So, um, but yeah, just an idea to keep them back in the back of our minds. And then to your, to the, where different people are in different stages, I suppose that's actually kind of on the agenda today with the maturity model framework that I'm gonna, I don't know, we may not talk about it today. We only have eight minutes left. It's kind of a lot to-, to I was, I was gonna ask about that. It seems uh, <laughs> we have a couple of other uh, items on the agenda that look shorter. Are you okay with that? Yeah, we can move that. I think that's fair, yeah. I'll give myself and an I've, action item and to put that at the top of the agenda next time. Yeah, and I shared everything I needed to in chat so people could read the chat.
but in the interim, not to talk about it today, but Chan, if you do, if you look at the um, uh, the meeting minutes, well, here, I'll just share my screen really fast. You can click here. It's just this OSPO maturity framework. And it might be something that could help this conversation. And if you have comments, maybe before the next meeting, you know, or thoughts, um, it'd be great. You could put it just in there. Maybe we could talk prior to the next meeting. Yeah, for sure. Thank you for that. Yeah. Cool. Thanks. Cool. And Sean, you said that we you'd already covered in the chat the Yeah, I, I shared the <laughs> links and some commentary on on the beta project that we're doing. It's uh, coming along and uh, it's in release now. You can sign in, create an account, add your repos. We'll get the data in the next week. There'll be email updates on when your data is collected. If we don't already have it, um, that that's the short of it. I'll I'll talk about this in small chunks over time. Sean, one quick question on Augur because I was playing with it a little bit. When it says there's not enough data available, um, is is it possible to get a? Uh, will there be? So I'm not really asking for something, uh, some sort of description of what that threshold is just out of interest. Because sometimes I feel like that data should exist. Or... Um, it, so yeah, there will be. Okay. It, um, in, in, some, in some cases, that's the message that you get if, if you added a new repo and it hasn't been collected yet. Um, okay. But, but um, are, is, is it the Emma Irwin, Emma Irwin repo that you added? Oh. <laughs> I was just literally playing. Yeah, I don't yeah, have no. data for that. I think the one that I was looking at was maybe it was Power Toys, Microsoft Power Toys, because that's quite a busy repo. Okay, it could be that we just haven't. That was I, I made a very large collection at ChaosCon, so I'm gonna okay. look at I'm gonna look for Power Toys and see what's going on there, um, and and then look to provide more direct messages on the on the Augur interface. The, the primary interface we're going to is the eight not one because it's a dash plotly data science tool um, much more easy to modify than most web stuff. Um, but but obviously the other auger front end still exists so I'll, I'll take a, I'll take a look at that and see if we can provide some more useful messages, I know we can so i'll open an issue to provide more useful messages. Okay yeah I, I can also do that Thanks. I can kind of give you work that's for sure. No, no, thank you. For, thank you for pointing that out. It's better to point it out than to have people just be pissed about it or annoyed or think there's no value because it's not explained. I'd rather get the, I'd rather get the issue opened or get the comments. So thank you. Gotcha. No problem. Okay, so we have we have four more minutes. Um, let's let's uh, talk a little bit about backing up references on the metrics knowledge base. Is this the chaos metrics knowledge base that you were talking about, Carrie? Yep, I was poking around the metrics knowledge base for reasons that I hope uh, y'all can put together because I mentioned it earlier. And I wanted to um, like back up some of the references that I'm seeing because some of them are very like useful extra context. And some of them I can't access anymore either because somebody took down the GitHub pages site or you know they changed the layout of the website and how they wanted to do it. Um, that's a pretty solvable problem for future proofing those references and links because I think that they do provide important context for why the metrics are the way that they are. I'm basically signing up to be like, I can just put in a bunch of link changes to an archive website, like uh, if we have a preference, otherwise I was just going to use the Wayback Machine. Yeah, I'm basically just want to turn the website we can do just for future we can do uh wordpress has like a link checker so we can do that to try to keep track of that uh, or be a little more on top of it um but yeah that would be great if i don't know to put them in the internet archive i think it would be good what what other information do you need um to do that so you you were curious about where the knowledge base is is hosted out of which i think it's in github but elizabeth or ruth or somebody probably knows yeah, it's yeah, a it's, website. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, yes, it's it's hosted on GitHub. So those the metrics are individually hosted uh, on GitHub in the uh, repo for the, the working group that uh, defined them. So the, the example one that you had mentioned is a uh, DEI metric. So yep. that one is actually hosted in the, uh, the DEI working group uh, repo. So okay. in the near future, 
we will actually be adding uh, a link that'll take you directly to where that document is hosted. So if we want to do edits in the future, it'll be very, uh, very easy to do and easy to find. All right, if I don't hunt it down by then for all of the sites, then I'll wait for that link to show up. I assume it's going to be, you mentioned that it's um, in different working groups. Is that in different projects and repos, I assume? Yeah. Okay. So yeah. we yeah. have a, we have an Excel sheet also. You can go and browse all the metrics, their link on the website and their GitHub links, like the pages where you can propose the changes or anything. I've pasted a link over on the chat. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks, Manav. Yeah, I actually asked for the link to the GitHub page because every time I go to, uh, I'll see a typo in a metric and then I'll go to change it. And then I have to dig through six GitHub repositories to figure out the right one to find to find that particular metric to make the change. So I think it'll be helpful to have, have the, the source link there. Um, we have one more minute. Um, does anybody have anything that they want to put on the agenda for the next meeting? We will put the uh, metrics maturity model there. So we'll put that on the, the top since we didn't get to it this time. Um, yeah, and I think what I, what I, I was gonna say, what I would like to do is kind of take a look at the discussion we had today around viability and just see if that can't be kind of brought together, whether through existing metrics, you know, just as ways to think about some of these topics that came up or models, you know what I mean? Like, is there a way we can start kind of coalescing that conversation into metrics or models. Cool. Okay, I just took a note there. Um, cool. All right. Well, we are we are out of time. Thanks everybody for joining. If you think of any agenda items that you want to put on the agenda, just just go ahead. Um, anybody can add anything they want to the agenda. So this does not have to be. Um, this, is, this isn't really curated. It's a bit of a free for all based on what y'all want to talk about. So um, feel free to do that or send me a message or post it in one of the Slack channels for the for the working group and we're, we're happy to do that. So, so thanks everybody for joining us. We had some really interesting conversations. Yeah, thank you everybody. Nice to see everybody again. Enjoy the rest of your week. Bye everybody.